Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Effective Resume Thursday. Very glad you're with us today. It is March 17th, St. Patty's Day. Hope everybody's wearing green. I'm not wearing green. I don't know why I didn't think about it when I got up this morning, but uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please, let's see here, get this to go. Please note this event is being recorded and is currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel uh, for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window will not appear in the recording. For those people on Zoom, if you have any questions, please just put them into the Zoom chat window. For those watching on Facebook right now, thank you for joining us. Please just put any questions you have in the comment field. For anybody who is on Zoom, if you'd like to have your resume reviewed, we will have time at the end of the presentation to review one or two resumes. Uh, if you'd like to do that, you may just click on the chat window down where it says file. You can then attach your file. And uh, if you want to send it to me, uh, you can send it to me. And please be sure to delete your header information so that uh, your personal information doesn't land on Facebook out and add on uh, career on the YouTube channel forever and ever and ever. So you're welcome to delete your header information. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in 2008, I uh, started a website called careerdfw.org to help those who are unemployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In 2012, I started a second website, careerusa.org, to help those around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search That You May Not Know. It is available on Amazon. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. I'll tell you about our program we have coming up tomorrow at the end of this session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. Uh, you've got to remember, you can spend a lot of time on your resume and a lot of time on LinkedIn, but neither of those are going to get you a job. Your resume and your LinkedIn profile will only get you a phone call. How well you do your interview is how well is if you're going to get that job or not. So if you'd like to have more information, like to practice on the uh, with doing an interview, please reach out to me and I'll get your information on the pick group. Well, our speaker today is Susan Gray. She's a global talent acquisition and attraction leader. Susan, thank you for uh, joining us today. And I'll let you tell people more about yourself. Thank you. I am a currently a global talent leader at a company by the name of Vontier. Uh, Vontier is a Fortune 500 company based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. And part of uh, what we do there were, is looking at sustainable futures, uh, sustainable um, opportunities for the future. So, um, you know, our, our motto is accelerating sustainable smart solutions for the road ahead, but the types of things we are involved in, if you fill up your car with gas or charge it, we actually uh, manufacture the uh, dispensers themselves, as well as the payment systems uh, through Gil Barco, Matco Tools, many of you may have heard of with high-end uh, tools, Hennessy Automotive out of uh, Tennessee, Global Traffic Technologies, the way traffic moves, DRB systems is uh, car wash systems, the whole software as a service behind that. Uh, and uh, Teletrack Navman is telematics fleet management. So I am so excited to be with you here today to talk about effective resumes as we're looking at it. We're gonna dive a little bit into a number of different areas. And my hope is that you leave with some nuggets that help you in your job search and um, in the road ahead. And with that, can you see my desktop? Not yet. Okay. So you want to click on the very bottom and says share screen. And then yeah, I think, you know what I think happened, Jeff? I saw your screen and I didn't want to uh, get in it. So let's see. Does it work now? Not yet. Okay. Let's try okay, again. Share. Here we go. I think we should be good. All right. So the agenda, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between a bio and a master resume, key components of a resume, examples of content by resume type, and, um, you know, happy to review your resumes as well as some sample resumes. 
I ran through my bio, you know, the only other thing I didn't mention is today is the start of March Madness for those of you that haven't done your brackets. Huge basketball fan having gone to uh, Michigan State. So be interesting to see how this kicks off this year. And, uh, you know, as we move on and as Jeff said, happy St. Patrick's Day. Regarding using Zoom, uh, you know, there's a number of different things on the bottom, but you know, if, you, if you've never used Zoom before in this type of meeting, we do like interaction, hover your mouse over the lower part of the screen to see the Zoom menu. Um, we will be using the participant and chat functions today. So where you see chat as you have questions, um, don't hesitate to ask them. I also encourage you to provide reactions. Um, in the chat, my first question for you, and if you could put that there, we'll get to these um, you know, later in the presentation as a question you might have about resumes. This session is about you, so I wanna make sure we get any questions answered and dive into topics of interest to you. I then thought we would kick it off with a question and I, I just learned this this week so we'll see who knows this. I wish I had something special to throw your way, but who was the first resume written by? Does anybody know? And if you do, if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. Jeff, do you know the answer to this one? You, you may have you looked at my slides, right? Yes, I happen to, I was very uh, intrigued. And so I had to read the next slide to see what the answer was. <laughs> oh, there you go. So uh, Richard put down Moses. Nope. But it, you know, it could be, right? That I'm one. sorry, what was the question? Who was the first resume written by? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, so if you leave with nothing else, you'll have to if you're getting your green beer today, right? I'm watching March Madness. Anybody else have any guesses beside Moses? No Googling it. The answer is Leonardo da Vinci. And the reason he is looked at as the initial person for a resume is he took the time to talk about his accomplishments and what he had done chronologically on a piece of paper. So with that, I thought it might be interesting as we dive into this. And, and I found this interesting, Jeff, I don't know if you had a chance to go through it, but the timeline of resumes, right? Because you think about resumes, right? For most of us, they've been here our entire life. But in the 30s, they were just formalities. So if you can imagine, resumes were just little, like you would take a piece of paper like this, like you know me having my company information on it, put a little bit about yourself and share it over lunch. In 1940, resumes were like Facebook profiles and they included your weight, well, not that we include our weight in our Facebook profile, but your weight, age, height, marital status, and religion. In the 50s, resumes were no longer just formalities. They were now expected. So think about that. Resumes being expected have only been around about 70 years. Um, in the 60s, they started to include outside interests like sports and clubs, community work, philanthropy work. In the 70s, the you know, introduction of technology, right? Word processors, digital typesetting, for those of you that know what that is, made the resumes more professional and salesy. I thought this was interesting. I, I looked at that and said, some people on my team would not know what VHS is. Unfortunately, I am old enough to know. But the first VHS or you know, videotape portfolios were recorded and used in 1980. And the 80s is when books on resumes and career counseling began to boom. So you think about that, that's only about 40 years old, right? Online background checks did not start till the mid 80s. The RTF, right, you know, real text format on Microsoft wasn't released into the mid 80s. In 87 entered fax machines, which, you know, are still around, but, you know, it was then considered a cool way to send resumes. The internet and World Wide Web, you know, changed the way we do things, you know, mid 90s. 
you know, Monster and Career Builder both went live. 95 email became the cool way to send a resume before it was all faxes or, you know, think about it back in, back in the heyday, it was sending them a, a letter, right? Mailing your resume or visiting somebody in person to give them their resume. Um, dot com boom didn't hit till 2000 interactive resumes, 2002. And think about it. LinkedIn now is a little under 20 years old, but you think about, we're going to talk about LinkedIn today how much that's changed the face of things, you know? And, you know, if you think about resumes today, we'll, we'll try to hit on as much as this as we can, but they contain sometimes, you know, we recommend including your LinkedIn profile, which is a social media link. They're awful now, they're more, they're shorter now. And depending on what type of role you're targeting, you may wanna include a side resume with, um, you know, the digital piece, the infographic, having a website, um, you know, work papers and such like that. And so much of the graphic representation and stuff you can do. And we'll talk about what you need to do for an application as well as what you might have on the side. Any surprises there? For me, it's just the newness of this, right? I guess anything under a hundred years old is new. Any surprises for anyone else? It's, it's a very interesting detailed list to be able to sort of go back and think about, you know, I mean, I remember when I sent my first resume in 1980, after I graduated college, put it in the mail and was so excited when I heard back from uh, the NBC station here in Dallas, Channel 5. It was very exciting. It was a no, but it was still, <laughs> I got a response. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, you think about it, it was, you know, there was a time where even applications, we're going to talk about applicant tracking system, but all applications were online, right? I mean, were uh, paper applications that you would go in and fill out, so. I'm hoping that putting everything I have that's important in digital will actually work and that they won't change <clears throat> something away from digital <laughs> in 20, 30 years. Oh, there you go. There you, you know, who knows, right? You like, saved all that paper and then paper's gone now. So who knows? Yeah, exactly. I think if it teaches us anything, you never know. So I mentioned I am with a company. We have um, quite a few openings, but I just spotlighted some of the titles. We are hiring sales, buyers. Um, Hennessy's hiring a buyer that you know, needs somebody. Um, we have a cloud architect role um, with Insight 360 here in Houston. Um, Hennessy also is hiring field service people throughout the United States. A variety of different financial analyst positions. Uh, we do have a network architect role, a lead CRM developer, as well as a really cool role. It's um, the intermediary between technology and marketing to really look at like HubSpot and some of those tools and what you need and being a, um, helping one communicate with the other so we drive the right solution. Uh, I desperately need, if there's anybody on the line, a UX designer researcher to help with an innovation hub. We have a variety of marketing manager, project manager, scrum manager, openings, product owner, um, retail sales manager, point of sales, and then uh, a tax manager, state and local. We just hired a senior tax manager, but we'll be opening up this other role. So feel free to reach out to me directly and or go to our career site, www.careers.volunteer.com to learn more. And I'll show you Susan's LinkedIn profile at the end of this presentation. So you'll be able to see what she looks like to be able to connect with her profile. Awesome. So, you know, big reason we're here is, you know, I want my resume to be the one you remember. But when you think about it, you know, resume is just a part of the job search. And there's so much information out there. You can almost be information overload. So what I'm going to try to do is give you as much information you can leave with to help you craft a document that you're going to feel comfortable with, not only using for your applications, but also having with you as a aid on interviews because your resumes are great. It's almost like me having a PowerPoint. It gives you your speaking points about what you want to talk to when you're talking to an employer. So first we'll talk about applying for a position, right? You know, key things to keep in mind prior to applying. 
it says the average recruiter scans a resume for six to eight seconds. I hope it's longer than that, but it probably depends upon the recruiter and the rec load. Um, I've met with and talked to recruiters that have um, rec loads as big as, you know, you know, 50 recs or more. So, you know, keep that in mind, right? You know, dependent upon the company, somebody may have five positions they're managing, others may have a hundred plus. So, you know, be nice to your recruiter. They are your friend. They can help you. They will advocate for you. They want to fill that position as much, if not more than you want the position. They get measured generally on time to fill and finding the right person for the job. So build, you know, make that person your advocate, but do keep in mind, they generally have a lot on their plates, right? The best resume is targeted. So as somebody that looks at resumes day in, day out, it's real, you know, generally you meet with a hiring manager, you have a consultation and they give you the specific things they're looking for. And that'll be a list of must haves and nice to haves. So make it easy to, you know, to, you know, as you're looking at the positions, make sure it's aligned so a recruiter can look at it and understand why you thought you were qualified when you applied for the position. Um, there is a recommendation where you can customize the header for the position you're applying for. And another recommendation I have is, and we do this a lot when we're posting jobs, I'll do an analytic to look at job titles. So make sure whatever you were called at XYZ company aligns with the market or have that on your resume. Sometimes companies have specialized job titles, which might not align with the rest of the market. Uh, as you're pulling together your resume, I'm a big believer in amplifying and leveraging what's out there. So take the time to you know, look at job descriptions you know, you know, that align with what it is you want to do. And make sure you know, your resume, if you're a tax analyst, look at what is required and then you know, build out how you, you know, how you would align to that. The goal of a resume is to give a preview aligned to the job description identify the keywords and certifications to include in your resume. And I went, you know, I actually listened to a couple of webcasts, but I thought it was interesting. So many people use a tool and we're going to talk about it today called job scan. What they found is you do not, you're not looking for a hundred percent, right? You, you don't need everything that they're looking for to be on your resume. Actually like 40 to 50% is optimal they'll be able to tell them you mapped it. So you really want, if you get 40% or more, you're good. I am a big believer in this next one and I probably beat up my hiring managers more than I care to on this one. White space, don't be wordy. You know, utilize very simple terms, look for words you can take out, make sure there's white space. If you think about when you go to read something, if there's too many words on it, most people aren't gonna read it. So, you know, look at the formatting of whatever you're putting together. Um, I talked about reviewing great job descriptions, study great resumes when preparing yours and modernize the resume. So look at resumes that, of people that are similar to yourself. If you have friends that have put together resumes, look at that and look at how you can make that your own. Uh, as you build out your bullet points, there's three things to keep in mind. You want at least your results in an action, and that's called raw. But raw is results, action, and situation. So depending upon where you're at in your career junction, juncture, you might be able to speak to different things. But remember to show quantifiable results and accomplishments. And those are going to help you storytell in your resume interview. And we'll talk a little bit about homework I recommend doing before you even put things together so you have your numbers accurate. But you know, do you start thinking about what is it I accomplished? What did I do while I was there? What made me a great candidate? And a, a, another thing I want you to think about is before you do your interview, also think about what your key learnings are. So what did you do that didn't go well that you would do in the future? Because self-awareness and someone that is going to continually learn and not blame other people for their actions is a huge knockout factor in a lot of companies. So you wanna not only have the results action situation, but you also wanna be able to story tell about where you started and how you continually improved. 
The next is important. We're gonna talk about format your resume to be compatible with parsing functionality in ATS systems. And the number of ATS systems keeps growing, how they work keeps growing. But for many systems, I, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with the word parsing. You will attach your resume and it will fill out the fields in the application. What's really important is you wanna have a very simply formatted resume. If you have a lot of the design features, you know, as far as parsing, and, and we'll talk about some of the specifics that can muck it up, it, it will impact how it will load into the system. Dependent upon the type of position, you may wanna attach a link to a portfolio or website. So great example, I talked about UX design. If you're a UX designer, I wanna see your wireframes. I wanna see your mirror boards. I want an example of the storyboards you've done. If you're a developer and you're on GitHub, include that site so I can see not only do you have XY certification, but what you've done. So that customization I talk quite a bit about, but it's huge. In terms of formatting your resume to be compatible, I started to hit on this. And Jeff, I know that you know as much or probably not more about this specific topic than I do, but don't use columns and tables that can cause parsing errors. So you can, like in Tuleo, which we use, attach more than one document. So you could say you have a beautifully designed document, attach that as an extra, do extra document, but for the resume you're using to parse for the application process, if you have columns and tables, it's it, for a lot of the systems, it isn't going to um, fill out the application accurately. Um, the same thing with special characters and special formatting, headers or footers on page one. And we talked about jobscan.co, but if you're not using it, it's a great way to see, this is what the job description says, this is how my resume aligns. And then I do mention the resume, the cover letter and work samples. You can talk to 10 people, they'll give you 10 different answers about cover letters. You, you know, it's always good to have just in case, right? Um, and a lot of who looks at it, it just depends upon the manager. It just depends upon the recruiter. It's like going to a restaurant with five people in your family. One person's gonna get chicken, one person's gonna get fish, one person's gonna get shrimp. There's no rights or wrongs with so much of this, but I would rather have you fully prepared for that one out of the five that's gonna to wanna to see the cover letter. More advice regarding applying for a position. So I always like giving context. To me, context is huge. So as recruiters or you know, as people in the talent world, there is a, a branch within our government called the OFCCP. And a lot of the reason applicant tracking set up and, and systems are set up the way they are you know, set up is to ensure we don't discriminate, that we move people through the process in a timely basis, and that we, as we're looking at things, have clear reasons for qualification or disqualification. As part of that, the OFCCP recommends utilization of something called a disqualification question as part of the application process. So one of the things you'll see in many job descriptions is need to haves versus nice to haves. The recommendation, and you will see this, is many times if it's two need to haves, there'll be a customized question asked of you in terms of, um, you know, like say it's a, a, a VP tax, right? They're gonna require a CPA. Do you have a CPA? If you don't have a CPA, they're gonna knock you out. So be mindful that, you know, where that comes from and why it's there. Um, again, I talk about the review must have versus nice to have. More and more, I mean, it's a hot job market and it's a good you know, thing for you as you know, potential candidates, applicants, employers are hiring, there's a ton of positions. Uh, if it's a must have and you don't have it, have something related. You know, A lot of times the recruiters are looking for the must haves. If you don't have the nice to haves, that's fine. But if it's a must have, that's what the manager feels like you need day one. Um, LinkedIn, you know, ensure your LinkedIn profile is up to date, aligns with your resume, but also utilize LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a phenomenal tool and you can utilize it to identify connections at the company you apply for and or the recruiter who posted the position. 
So many times if I'm posting a position on LinkedIn, I'll, I'll click, you know, it, and you'll be able to see it if you click on it that I'm the recruiter. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. You know, uh, I can't stress the importance of not just applying, but follow up, but also make sure you build that relationship so you know how much follow up's too much. Um, you know, those relationships make a huge difference. The other thing you want to do with LinkedIn is understand who you know that's connected to that company. So say I'm, you know, want to go to work for Career DFW. I see that somebody by the name of Jeff Morris is in my network. Um, I may reach out to Jeff and say, hey, Jeff, I just applied for this uh, trainer position with Career DFW. You know, can you refer me? Employee referrals are strong. You know, if you think about the world we live in, whether it's IMDb for movies, Yelp for movie, you know, for um, restaurants, TripAdvisor, people like to know that somebody else advocates for somebody, you know, something. So a referral, you know, means a lot. Many times the person you reach out to will get a reward for the referral and help that referral out. Don't just tell them what you applied for, give them a specific position number or requisition number and help them sell you, give them the employee value, you know, the value proposition of how you're gonna make a difference for the company. The last piece is research the company. So and there's a ton of information out there, whether on Glassdoor or you know, variety of different sources. So have a value proposition and know why that company, why that position and the impact you can make. The more you research it, the more effective you'll be. Any questions so far? There are a few questions that have been put in the uh, chat window, but I don't know if you want to wait and sort of get through your okay. information. No, that works. We may answer a few of them. Okay, perfect. So we will move to resumes versus one page bio. A resume signals you're looking for a job, focuses on work history, details, and credentials, and is primarily a job search tool. And a biography can be used in many situations with less risk focuses on major accomplishments and expertise and is a multi-purpose tool. And this is an example of a, a one-page bio. So it can be used in many situations. There's a book called Be Sharp by Mina Brown um, that gives you information on that. But it's, you know, you know great, you know, tool to have. So pulling together your resume, I thought I would start with the recipe. So, you know, you think about a recipe, what ingredients do you need? My recommendation is, you know, you're gonna need this for your application as well. Double check your date. So pull together your educational credentials, be sure, you know, most companies do a background check anymore. So if you make it all the way through the interview process, you wanna make sure whatever dates you put on your resume and in the application is going to check out on that background check. So almost look at this like, I, you know, it's tax season, like you're filling out your tax form. Get your numbers prepared, right? So you want your educational credentials, not only your degree, I want to include high school, but, um, you know, what dates you were, were there, if you were um, went on scholarship, if there was a specific fraternity you were part of or sorority, if there was something special you did, if you received some phenomenal award. One of the clues recruiters do look for is they will look at some of these professional organizations, you know, or student organizations you were part of as a clue to, you know, different things you've done and, you know, looking at, did you not just go to school, but did you make an impact? Depending upon the role, certifications are huge. And, you know, there's so many different ways you can get certifications. So for a cloud architect, AWS certification is huge. For, um, um, for you know, if you look at um, uh, tax accounting, right, CPA, or, so it's really important if you have a certification, have it on there, as well as if you're a technical person, you do wanna include all the tools that you utilize. A great one, um, and not even technical, if you're marketing, I just uh, you know, started working on a marketing role, they wanna know if somebody's used HubSpot or something like that. So put those tools that you use to do your job. Recruiting, they wanna know what applicant tracking systems you've used, 
um, what research tools you've used, what techniques you've used. Employment history, the same thing. You want to get that accuracy on your resume so that your application is accurate because your application is what is going to be used from a background check. So take the time to double check your dates. Um, accomplishments, I can't speak, you know, higher, you know, more important of this. Go back through your awards and look at what you accomplished. This is how you help sell yourself on an interview. Pull those together. And you can have a long list. What you include on the resume that you apply with may not include everything you've accomplished, but you want it to draw from. Any awards and then volunteer community work. So in terms of preparation, do your homework, create an outline of your history with dates, prepare concise statements for each position, clearly showing what you were responsible for and what you accomplished. Outcomes are huge, right? You don't have to put every single thing you did. I, and I sometimes get job descriptions like this. It's almost like I took out the trash on a weekly basis. I, I, I don't need to know that. I filed, I don't need to know that. It's like, what outcomes did you drive through your you know, um, results? The other thing you wanna keep in mind as you build these, show your competencies. Are you collaborative? Are you inclusive? Have you introduced innovative things? So you're helping show what kind of team member you're gonna be. Um, financial acumen, agility. And where possible, use specific numbers to quantify your achievements. Nothing works like numbers and percentages. We recommend pulling together, and Jeff's heard me say this before, master resume. It can be up to 10 pages long. This is not what you're applying with. Get all your data there. Somebody mentioned having a digital footprint. Start building it today, you know, and that way you can go back to it and say, okay, what do I want to include here? Um, include all your jobs, names and contact information of your supervisors or prior leaders. If you get to the point we're making an offer, we do do reference checks, having that information up to date is huge. And include all your areas of expertise, certification, software skills. Um, you know, if you've been to uh, a, a recent, I, I see a lot of people that their company sponsored them to go to management training through Harvard or Yale or you know, various organizations that are well known, include that information on your master. There's, as you start playing together your resume, so that's your master, what do you actually want to include? There's, you know, four different formats that I've really seen. One is your complete employment history. The second is the most recent 10 to 15 years experience. The third is where someone details the last 10 to 15 years. <laughs> and as a section called prior relevant experience. And what I'm seeing more and more, and has become more standard, is where, <coughs> so sorry, there's a breakout career shift. I spoke to, there's a person that just joined our team. Her first career was as a nurse. She's now in HR. So it's being able to show that career shift. And sometimes the skills you pick up, even if it's a completely different area in that career shift, can be meaningful in the new job. In terms of guidance from the Professional Association of Resume Writers and Career Coaches, we talked about this before with white, you know, the white paper, but um, what, ensure it's easy to read. Double check, use that editor function, you know, in Word or whatever, you know, formatting you're using to make sure there's no spelling, punctuation, or grammatical errors. Spell out acronyms. I can't tell you how many acronyms mean one thing at one company. There's some companies where they have five acronyms that mean the same thing. My, my favorite, when I first got, you know, started at HP many years ago, <coughs> we had the term um, SAP. I thought for the longest time it was the um, SAP, the software. It actually stood for Salary Administration Plan. Finally figured out it was two different things. So never put an acronym on your resume and assume somebody else is gonna know what you're talking about. Um, CPA may be a little bit different, you know, so, something that it's, it's, it's what you call somebody, you don't have to necessarily spell out like, you know, MD if you're a doctor, certified public accountant, but most acronyms I would recommend spelling out. 
Um, focus on skills related to the target job. Um, that you're an expert gardener, you may not need to put that on unless it's something related, right? Include qualitative and quantitative accomplishments. I talked about, you know, some of the key competencies people look for, like innovation, um, collaboration, self-awareness. You want that to show up. You, you want your personality to show up on the resume. And again, you know, uh, when you're putting that resume in for parsing, no graphics, pictures, underlines, or boxes for whatever you're parsing into the applicant tracking system. So we're gonna dive into the key components of a resume. The first is your heading, the second summary, um, key accomplishments. You can have separate, I generally like to see it with the specific job. Again, it's a matter of personal taste, but for me, I like to understand what you did where, not to see it separated out. Professional experience, previous relevant experience, education, and then instead of software skills, I would say certifications and technology skills. The heading, different people have different thoughts here. Um, your name, use the name you like to be called, but it's, I, I would also recommend you know, having your formal name on the resume, if that's what you're going to be called once you're there. So you can have, like, I'll see, like, say like, I was going to be called Sue, right? You could have Susan and then a parenthesis Sue Gray. Um, you know, I, I'll see, we had somebody working for us where they were known by their middle name. It does help to have your whole formal name. It gets really confusing as a recruiter where you apply and it says one thing and your resume says something else, but I would have put in parentheses what it is people call you. Um, contact information, you wanna be easy to contact and put what it, what it is. So if you have a phone number, make sure and put cell you know, next to it or you know, what, what it is. An email address, your LinkedIn profile, most systems anymore link directly to LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, I highly recommend if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, create one. Um, and I mentioned GitHub and Stack Overflow from a technology standpoint. Uh, Canva, I think, is great for design, you know, UX designers. Uh, you know, so any sites you can put from a portfolio standpoint, depending upon the type of role, would be huge. And then location. Uh, if you want it, if you're looking for something in that location is probably a good thing to have. Um, what we're seeing due to COVID, and I should have included a slide to talk about the changes since COVID, because we talk a lot about this, right? You know, as uh, talent professionals, where so many positions used to require you being in the office, there's more flexibility than ever before. There's a lot of companies that will require somebody to be in the office part-time sometime, um, but, you know, I, you know, that might be something you want to think about yourself is, are you looking for something remote or are you open to something where you might have some time in the office or some time travel time? And if you are open to relocate, you know, if it is something where they are requiring you to be on the office, it's not a bad idea to put it there. In terms of the summary profile, again, Use LinkedIn to your advantage. It's such a great research tool, but make sure whatever you put as that headline aligns not only with the position, but is a, a common used um, uh, title. And areas of expertise, you know, is a really nice way to pick up some of the keywords from the job app, you know, from the job description. Key accomplishments. Like I said, you can you can put them separate. For me, I like to see them under the position. I like to know what you did in each position. But these are really well written. The key here is always include action verbs, and you can see it has um, you know specifically what's been achieved, how you exceeded. I cover this a little bit later, but in a sales perspective, you you need to always include quantifiably what you did and how you achieved and how much the quota was. In terms of the professional experience, there's you know many thoughts on this, but I, I still go to chronological. People wanna know where you were at when. 
The biggest difference I can say is there's now such a change to talent marketplaces and contract work. If you do work contract, I would call it out because there are traditional hiring managers that will look at those dates and wonder why you've had so many jobs. So if it was a contract or a consulting assignment versus a full-time job, if the company was acquired or you know it was COVID related, it's okay to put that information there. Um, include a one line description of the company and, and do limit the number of bullets. So you're gonna have that master resume, right? With everything on it, select which ones are most relatable to that specific job and do focus on results. Many people interview based on your resume. So once you get in the door, they look at your resume, they wanna hire, you know, visit with you, have the story you wanna tell in front of you. You don't wanna you know, hang up from talking to the recruiter or the hiring manager and go, ah, I forgot to tell them A, B, C, D, E, F. By having it on your resume, it makes it easier to talk about. Regarding details, you know, limit to five, six bullet points per job, focus on the results, and they should not sound like a job description. So you don't wanna take the job description and put it on your resume. What you wanna do is really show it, you know, a great example as a leader, and I'll give you some thoughts, you know, by job type. You wanna show, hey, this was my budget. This is what I accomplished. This was the year over year difference. Look at what they're, you know, looking for in terms of outcomes and show them how you've done it through your own results. I love this and I have to say, this makes me miss my friend Carol Burkell all the more, um, but play the so what game. So this is a focus on results. And, you know, yeah, so you guided the next phase of brand evolution for a multimedia artist and managed the film production and publishing. Always keep in mind, why should I care, right? So what? So the answer, you know, this person gave was they just increased the business opportunity, which led to 10 new commissions for my client. Okay, so now suddenly it matters, right? And then enhanced text focusing on results and keywords, increased business opportunities, including 10 new commissions for my client based on developing a full social media and PR strategy. I find managers do the same thing with job descriptions. You really want to tie what you did and what the results and outcomes were. People want people that are gonna join their team that are gonna drive outcomes and then are self-disciplined and accountable and all, you know, great collaborative, all those other wonderful things. This one's huge. And I, it's probably something that I as a recruiter and recruiting manager have run into more people that have looked at resumes where somebody has been with one job for 20 years and thought they had 20 different jobs. We do look for your career direct trajectory and did you do more than one thing? But if you put all your, your, uh, your dates to the right-hand side and write justify it, I can't tell you how many people don't take the time to really look at your resume and understand that this is all the same company. So it's really important, put it in parentheses next to the title. Um, if it's a promotion, call it out, you know, it's just huge. List the company name once. If the company was acquired, still list the company name once. Um, you can put, you know, what, what the acquisition was or that that company went away, but you don't want, you know, you don't want to look like, you know, if, and I've seen this with so many people, there's been so many we're, we live in the age of mergers, acquisitions, divestitures. Um, and, and if you're promoted, you don't want to look making it look like you don't have the stickiness to stay in a job. This, in terms of handling companies that have changed names, give the current name followed by the old name. I like the fact where you, whatever the most famous name is, use that because I know there's a gentleman who worked for Campbell Soups. It was acquired by company A and then was acquired by company B. And I'd never heard of company B's name, but I all know, but I know what Campbell Soup is. So use that most famous name and just say acquired by company A, then company B. I agree. Education and software skills. Um, you do want to include not just software school skills, but tools. 
you know what I mean? And this is going to vary, you know, and I, I did pull together some slides to talk about some things by job family. I'm a big believer as I'm recruiting, defining by persona, but also having you, you know, customized by the type of role you're looking for, how you build your resume. And this has a great example of how to write, you know, if you don't have a degree, you know, school, city, state, major area concentration. If, if you did have a scholarship, if there was something special you did, especially depending upon how many years you're out of school, a lot of recruiters do look for, you know, professional organizations, fraternities, sororities, you know, specific work you've done with a specific charity. A lot of that can make you stand out. Um, and, you know, I, I, I jokingly brought up March Madness, but I do have to say there is a bias in your favor if you did, you know, play college athletics. So if you were a college athlete, make sure and get that on your resume. It's a great opener in terms of the interview. In terms of filling the gap, you can do it through showing community leadership and consulting. Um, today, more than ever, I'm seeing, you know, just an impact you made, you know, and um, thanks to COVID, this has all changed. Thanks to talent marketplaces, this has changed, you know, and talent marketplaces being people doing gig work and such like that. So um, there's a variety of different ways you can do that. Align the resume to the type of role. We've talked about that and the order of your resume will vary depending upon the type of position you're applying for. So I gave some examples of things you wanna include by type of resume. On a leadership resume, you wanna include the scope of your responsibility, the size of your budget, your accomplishments, the size of your organization, the location of your organization. Was it local, regional, global? Um, quantifiable results year over year, strategy and execution, and um, training. For sales, technical support services, again, scope of responsibility, quota and quota attainment, type of clients, you know, the industry you called on, um, and who, you know, what department within that industry you called on, um, your scope, any specialization, what the product solution services you sold were, and what was your role? Was it new business? Was it account management? Were you technical support? Um, any awards you won? You know, sales, they're looking for, you know, were you cold calling? What, what were you doing? Were you inside sales, outside sales? Spell it out. In terms of a technical resume, you wanna make sure you include your certifications, your tools. I talked about having a link to GitHub or Stack Overflow. If you've been a speaker at, I don't know, Women in Technology or Grace Hopper, that's huge, you know, or anything you've done from a diversity perspective, those stand out really well today. Um, educational credentials, examples of projects you were involved in, what you accomplished. If you automated something, you took, um, you know, you know, from a, like if it was a recruiting project, if it was HR system, if you implemented a new HRIS system resulting in, H, you know, or human resources information system, and it resulted in XYZ, that's important. Who were the stakeholders you dealt with? People look for people that have dealt with, you know, collaborated on teams. Did you work on any special projects and any awards you won? A marketing resume, marketing is huge right now, but it's the type of marketing. Was it content marketing, product management, you know, digital marketing, what you are responsible for, strategies implemented and results, certifications, tools, product solutions, services, the impact, and your clients, like what market were you targeting? A creative resume, design candidates should include work samples. It's huge, right? Um, more so than even your resume is how you present if you're you know, looking for like a UX designer and you wanna provide the tools used and skills. With that, it really helps to have an online portfolio. And then communications resume should include types of communication channels. So were you communicating internally, externally, digital? Were you doing newsletters? Were you doing videos? If so, what was your part? Um, anything you can do to highlight your skills. So I'll stop for a second, because I, I know we only have nine minutes left 
but Jeff, were there any specific questions we should dive into before we start looking at aligning a resume to a job description? Yeah, all uh, right. The first question Paul asked, how do you deal with a gap as being a family caregiver? Do you leave it off or do you address it in the interview or do you put something in your resume, family caregiver? Put it in your resume, family caregiver. I can't tell you the number of organizations that understand this and how many people I've talked to that have been through this. Our world has changed and is more inclusive than ever. And if they're not, I, I'm so biased this way. If they're not an organization that's not going to appreciate you and empathize with you, if you've gone through that, they may not be an organization you're going to want to stay with long term. And I'd probably, if you're going to put on your resume, you want to also have some kind of conclusion to it saying that, you know, whatever, you know, as a family caregiver, everything is now taken care of. You no longer have to, you're no longer responsible or something to let people yeah. know that. Exactly. Uh, put, put something in there. All right, uh, Monica asks, uh, if your most recent position is one that is not the most important, what's the best way to handle this? A great question. Um, you know, I think you still want to have the recent there, but I think you really want to make sure your bullets are strong. I, I love bolding, you know what I mean, and, and spotlighting some of the other things. That's what a cover letter helps with. Um, you know, your, that's what your headline, you know, how we show the description of everything you've done helps with. But I still do recommend a, a chronological. Jeffy, your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I think the thing, the point is that if it's not that important, the maybe you only put one or two bullet points underneath it that have the results of something that maybe will relate to the job that you're applying to. And the prior jobs that were more rel relative, you maybe have more bullet points listed there. So that's how you would emphasize what you've done in the past that would help do, the, you know, meet the needs of the customer or the company. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I am an information security specialist who does not use social media. What advice do you have for people like me who do not network via the online platforms? A good question. Um, and I get it. In fact, I, uh, we're, we're actually hiring, you know. So I think it's totally understood not to have the profile, but if you do do Google search, I would find a way to do some research to get some of the information out there. I, you know, I, I think the hard part is it's almost like our worst best friend, right? There's so much power there, but you know, with security being um, of a concern. The other thing that, you know, as, as I think about it, and this is also something you should have on your resume, if you are active in a professional organization, even as, you know, an executive, you do want to have that there. So if you're part of an, of an information security group. Um, those are excellent to tap into for networking on leads in terms of different people that might be able to, you know, you might be able to talk to about what, how they pulled together their resume and what they've done. You know, I mean, um, if you're a CPA, you should definitely have on, you were part of AI CPA. If you're, you know, those professional organizations are, are just huge. Right. And, I, you know, I think that you've got to have a LinkedIn profile, no matter what it is you do. I remember years ago meeting somebody at several job fairs when I was doing, a, you know, promoting career DFW. And, you know, one guy kept showing up and he said, yeah, I don't have a social media presence because he has a top secret clearance and he can't be found. He's not supposed to be seen. But you know what? You can have a, a generic LinkedIn profile that tells somebody what it is you do and how you can help them without exploring any secrets. Now, if it's truly top secret kind of stuff and you're not supposed to be found anywhere, that's one thing. But, you know, for the most part, you want, you don't need to have Facebook or Twitter or any, you know, on TikTok or any of those other things. But to me, so many recruiters use LinkedIn. You, if you want to be found, you know, with the right keywords, LinkedIn is going to do it for you. Yeah, from a, from a technical standpoint, I think that's where it's more like, you know, GitHub, Stack Overflow, some of those sites. But 
it's if you don't want to use the digital footprint, I would use the good old fashioned professional networks, you know, there's, right. there's still, they're still, they're still valuable. All right. Uh, what percentage of job applications are pre-screened by AI before being reviewed by a human recruiter? So you said you use Taleo. Do you then, you wait for people to fill out the ATS system before Taleo before you start searching or do you start searching first or how do you do it? I look at everything. I even look at those where the job, you know, someone didn't complete the application. So it really depends on the person. I think what's key is not the AI, it's those disqualification questions I talked about earlier. That's, you know, really is, did you say you were disqualified? If you said you were disqualified, it's going to pop up that you're disqualified. Okay. Uh, what institutions do you recommend using to obtain free certifications? It's a great question. So I'm not sure about free, but in terms of technology, you know, LinkedIn has certification tests you can take. So that, that might be one is to, you know, go through, if you, you know, do their different tests that align um, and get those, rec you know, we didn't talk about this at all today, but if you have references, I do, and when I'm analyzing people, there's times I'll go from the ATS to LinkedIn and see how many people recommended them and what they had to say about them. So ask people for recommendations on LinkedIn. I, I have done that for executive level hires to see how many people go in and what they're saying about them. It's, it's huge. Um, you know, there's, it just depends on the person. You know, it depends on the recruiter looking at it. Right. I mean, I know in our LinkedIn training, nowadays LinkedIn, it shows three different, you can see three recommendations pop up automatically. You, you know, when we talk about this, you want to make sure that you've got recommendations from 2021 and 2022 there that pop up as the last three. If your last recommendation says 2014, it's going to go, well, what's going on here? You know, um, yeah, make it easier for recruiters to be able to put that in there. Uh, Monica says, I've heard that uh, at sen that senior to executive level should not include skills like Microsoft Office Suite as products, et cetera. Is this accurate? I don't think you need to include it. Um, you know, if you're a senior level person, the kind of things they want to know is, are you making board level presentations and where you stand within the organization? You know, how big is the scope of your responsibility? What did you manage? What did you drive? Did your business grow when you were leading it? What was the year over year difference? So it's, and then again, that's where it's really good to do your research to see what's out there. Um, you probably don't need to put the basics, but board level presentations is huge. Did you drive strategy or were you the one executing? So, you know, I think the key here is that if the job description says Microsoft Office, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, then you want to list it because that's just another keyword match that the ATS will match up. If it doesn't mention that and you're an executive or senior level position, everybody's going to assume you know how to use those features. You would you would you would hope so, right? Yeah. <laughs> unless they're unless they're a Mac based person, in that case they may not. You know they're using pages and numbers or whatever uh, the uh, Apple system is. Exactly. All right. Well. Uh, it is two o'clock right now. I don't know. We don't necessarily need to go over this. Any parting, uh, you know, if you had two or three bullet points that you'd like to, you know, two or three bullet points that you'd like to share, what would they be? Be positive. Be positive. Um, you know, as you look at your past experiences, people want to hire people that are happy people, that are smiling, that present things in a positive light. I can't tell you the number of people that are extremely qualified that have been knocked out because they did not present positively. Be self-aware, know your strengths, know your opportunities, and be able to talk about your key learnings. Show collaboration, you know, and integrity. And, and the other, you know, key not to do don't talk anything that's politically charged, you know, especially today, you know, stay, stay away from that, but, but have fun with it. You know, you, you have to consider this is networking. There's no right or wrong. 
And, and the final thing is follow up, follow up, follow up, you know, make each person want to work with you. People are not just looking at, are you qualified? They're going, is this somebody I want to deal with daily? Right. Well, Susan, thank you very, very much. Uh, here is Susan's profile uh, on LinkedIn. If you'd like to link in with her, this is what it looks like. Uh, send a message uh, or, you know, let her know why you should connect. If you want to connect with Susan, please uh, click on the blue connect button and send a personal note telling you saw her here today on Effective Resume Thursday. So awesome. Susan, and follow Bontier on LinkedIn. I'm trying to get us up because we're a new company to 5,000 followers. So help me get to my goal and I will so appreciate each of you. Oh, so that, that leaves another, that, that's sort of a question on one of our LinkedIn presentations. We talk about following a company is very important that if you're doing a search that if you see the person's already following the company, you maybe have a better chance of getting that interview because you have been following the company, you know what's going on. True? Um, yes. And in addition to that, it gives you key insights that you can use to tailor your resume for what the company does and why you want to be a part of them. Right. All right, Susan, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Take uh, care. I do have a sample T cover letter, a sample one page bio and a uh, sample resume. If you'd like to get any of those, you're welcome to uh, send me an email at resume at careerdfw.org, resume at careerdfw.org. And I will send those, uh, send that out to you. Uh, Career DFW and Career USA, we're putting on training four days a week. Please join us. Tomorrow morning, negotiations, how to close that deal, how to, you know, how to get what you want uh, at the end of the day. So. Uh, Crystal Yates will be with us tomorrow, and she's going to be talking all about negotiations. Next Tuesday for our LinkedIn presentation, I'll be doing it. I, I hear he's a really good speaker. And uh, LinkedIn, present yourself like a pro. So come join us next Tuesday at 1. Next Wednesday at 1 o'clock, if you're interviewing Wednesdays, we'll have a practice interview team practice interview that you can watch. So uh, as I said before, your resume and LinkedIn doesn't get you a job. It only gets you a phone call. How you interview is what's going to get you the job, how you answer those questions when they call you up. And then next Thursday, being the fourth Thursday of the month, we're going to talk about networking. We have a different networking speaker who shares their thoughts all about networking. This session has been recorded. It will be on the Career DFW Facebook page, and I'll upload it to the Career USA YouTube channel. It'll take a couple hours before it's on there. You can go back, you can watch any of these, uh, you can watch the presentation over and over, get the information that you'd like to get. If you want to copy anything off, you're welcome to do so by watching those presentations again. Uh, on the Career USA YouTube channel, click on playlist, otherwise you just see a bunch of different videos in some random order, and then pick whichever playlist you want. Every video that I upload, I put into a playlist, so you can click on effective resumes, and then underneath there, don't click on the video, but click view full playlist, and then up will come a list of all the different dates and titles and topics. And you can go back and you can watch any one of those videos uh, to your delight to uh, get the information you need. If you're not receiving emails about our workshops, please, you can send an email to careerusa, the plus sign, subscribe at groups.io. Uh, you will not be spammed, but what you will get, because I control the list, I'm the only one who can send a message out, but what you will get is a topic of the day, a title of the day, and most importantly, the Zoom link of the day. That way you can grab your lunch or grab your breakfast on Friday mornings and uh, just click on the link and you'll be able to join us immediately. We remember, Career at FW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have no full or part-time employees. Uh, Susan volunteered today. I'm a volunteer. Everything I've done in the last 13 years is just been here to help you land your next great opportunity. So please consider making a donation when you do get that next great job. So thank you very much for joining us today. Susan, once again, thank you very much for your time. Everybody have a great Thursday and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning or one day next week.